Assalamu alaikum everyone, welcome back to another ATP video. In this video, we'll be covering systemic fungi, also known as systemic mycosis, including histoplasmosis, blastomycosis, coccidioides, and paracoccidioides. They're called systemic because these fungi can disseminate and infect multiple organ systems. Remember from our intro to fungi video where we mentioned fungi can exist as dimorphic or as monomorphic forms? Systemic mycosis are dimorphic, which means they exist as molds at cooler temperatures and as yeasts at warmer ones. Remember, mold in the cold, yeast in the heat. In other words, these fungi exist as molds in the environment, which is cold, but in human hosts, they take the form of a yeast. The key points that you need to take away from this video are the locations these fungi are endemic in, their clinical presentation, and their yeast form under potassium hydroxide prep microscopy, which will help confirm the diagnosis. You absolutely need to remember the geographical areas these fungi are endemic in, because these are important clues in the question vignettes to help you narrow down your differentials as symptoms can sometimes overlap between these fungal infections. So knowing the geographical distribution can guide you toward the right answer. At the end of this video, we will include key distinguishing clinical features to make it easier for you guys. Before we discuss these key features, we'd like to mention a few points that all of these systemic fungi have in common. First, Systemic fungi are transmitted through respiratory droplets or inhalation of spores. When they infect an immunocompetent host, these fungi produce no symptoms or mild flu-like symptoms. However, the exception to this rule is blastomycosis, which can present with disseminated disease in an immunocompetent host as well. When treating patients infected by these fungi, you need to remember that for local infections, we usually treat them with the drugs that belong to the class of azoles. We will mention specific drugs when we discuss the individual fungus in detail. For disseminated disease or patients who don't respond to initial azoles therapy, we treat them with IV amphotericin B. Now let's discuss each one of these systemic fungi individually. The first systemic fungus we will discuss today is histoplasmosis. Histoplasmosis are endemic in the Midwestern and Central US along the Mississippi and Ohio River Valley. This fungus lives in soils rich in nitrogen, in other words, soils with added fertilizers or with birds or bats droppings. People get infected when they get exposed to and inhale fungal spores in farms, construction areas, or while exploring caves. As stated earlier, most people infected remain asymptomatic or present with mild flu-like symptoms and erythema nodosum which are painful tender nodules on the shins. Erythema nodosum represents an active immune response, so it mainly presents in immunocompetent patients. However, in an immunosuppressed individual, histoplasmosis can disseminate and present with hepatosplenomegaly, ulcers of the mucosal surfaces, and lymphadenopathy. Can you think of another differential where patients can present with similar symptoms? Yes, sarcoidosis. Sarcoidosis can also present with erythema nodosum, hepatosplenomegaly, and hilar lymphadenopathy. So the question is, how would you differentiate between them? For histoplasmosis, they will include the geographical distribution and will give you a clue for an exposure like a farmer or a cave explorer, or perhaps a worker in a construction site where soil has been disturbed and spores are being inhaled. For sarcoidosis, they will mention an African-American woman with more unique symptoms that are not seen with histoplasmosis, such as anterioveitis, Bell's palsy, or a blood test showing hypercalcemia. Now for the diagnosis. A CBC of an infected patient can show pancytopenia, and the chest x-ray will show diffuse nodular densities, focal infiltrate or cavity, or lymphadenopathy. The best confirmatory test you would do when you suspect histoplasmosis is urine and serum polysaccharide antigen test, culturing, or using clinical specimens to view the yeast form under potassium hydroxide prep, which usually takes time. Silver stain or bronchoalveolar lavage, which shows macrophages filled with yeast, confirms the diagnosis. These systemic mycoses are differentiated from each other by comparing the size of their yeast form to the RBC. Since histoplasmosis hides inside macrophages, they are smaller than RBC. So you will notice that as we move along with each fungus, the size of the yeast will increase in size. 
Can you guess how we treat these infected patients with histoplasmosis? That's correct, azoles. Most commonly used azole is itraconazole for local infections, and for systemic infections, we give the usual amphotericin B, then oral itraconazole. Next are the blastomycosis. These fungi are endemic to southeastern, central US, Great Lakes, and Ohio River Valley. Unlike the other systemic fungi, blastomycosis can cause disseminated disease in immunocompetent hosts as well. Most patients present with pneumonia. It can present on chest x-ray as hazy alveolar infiltrates, or it can also present with lesions or cavities in the lungs. In an immunosuppressed patient, this fungus can disseminate from the lungs to the skin and present with verrucous and granulomatous lesions of the skin. These lesions resemble squamous cell carcinoma. Moreover, blastomycosis can spread to the bone and cause osteomyelitis, most commonly in the ribs, vertebra, and the long bones. Just like histo, blasto can be detected via urine antigen test. Under potassium hydroxide prep, the yeast form of this fungi grows as broad-based budding, and these are the same size as RBCs. Again, for local infection, we treat patients with fluconazole and itraconazole. For systemic infections, we give IV amphotericin B. Moving on to the coccidioides, our third guest for the day. These are endemic in the southwest US and California. People get infected when they inhale the spores in these endemic regions, usually during earthquakes or windstorms. It's also known as valley fever. They cause flu-like symptoms or pneumonia in healthy people, presenting as cough, fever, and arthralgia, which is joint pain. However, in immunocompromised patients, it can disseminate to the skin, lungs, and bone. It can also spread to the CNS and cause meningitis. You can diagnose by sending culture or viewing them under potassium hydroxide prep. You can also send for serology to look for antibody titers, in which IgM against cocci will represent recent infection. Potassium hydroxide prep confirms the diagnosis, and the yeast form are seen as large spherules containing endospores, which when rupture can disseminate to different organs. These spherules appear to be bigger in size than RBCs. Again, for local infection, we treat with azoles such as ketoconazole or itraconazole, and for systemic infection, we treat with IV amphotericin B. The last systemic fungi we will discuss today are the paracoxidiomycosis that are endemic to the South and Central America. People get infected when they are exposed to respiratory droplets from another infected person. Initially, patients present with cough, then the fungus disseminates and causes lymphadenopathy. It can present with cervical, axillary, and inguinal lymphadenopathy. The fungus then spreads to the upper respiratory system and involves the lungs, causing granulomatous lesions of the lung. Paracoxidioides also cause painful nasal and pharyngeal ulceration. So the important clinical features you need to remember are granulomatous lesions of the lung, lymphadenopathy, and oral ulcers. Now to diagnose a patient infected with this fungus, under potassium hydroxide prep, the yeast form will look like a central vacuole with multiple buds radiating out, giving a captain's wheel appearance with budding yeast. So think of a pirate on a cruise through the South America while navigating his captain's wheel on a hot sunny day. Treatment is itraconazole for mild infection and amphotericin B for systemic infection. In summary, we talked about the different systemic mycosis, and we will conclude by showing you a table that will help summarize all the key points we mentioned today. For histoplasmosis, it's endemic in Mississippi and Ohio River Valley. It's common in farmers and cave explorers. Key distinguishing features, mucosal ulcers, hepatosplenomegaly, erythema nodosum, and pancytopenia. And for the yeast form, we can find them inside macrophages, for blastomycosis, it's endemic in southeastern, central U.S., Great Lakes, and Ohio River Valley. Clinical feature-wise, inflammatory lung disease with lazy infiltrates on chest x-ray, and the yeast form is broad-based budding. For coccidioides, it's endemic in southwest U.S. and California, and it's associated with dust exposure. Clinical features include erythema nodosum, arthralgia, and meningitis. For the yeast form, spherules containing endospores. Lastly, paracoxidioides, it's endemic in South and Central U.S. Clinical features include pharyngeal ulcers, lymphadenopathy, which involves the cervical, axillary, and inguinal nodes, 
And lastly, these form as a captain's wheel's appearance. Try to remember the unique appearance of each fungus used form and the important associations, and you should be golden. And that's it for systemic mycosis. We hope you found it beneficial. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to receive our latest updates. And as always, thanks for watching.